Um, so my talk tonight is going to be about two entangled topics. One is about certificate authorities and the security of TLS and SSL and HTTPS. Uh, and the other is about uh, protection against various kinds of attacks, inc including connection blocking and certain kinds of censorship attacks. Uh, and these things turn out to be somewhat connected to one another. Uh, and hopefully this is a contribution. At the moment, this is a talk about a design document. Uh, we haven't built it yet. It's a vaporware talk. Uh, but we want feedback and uh, criticism of the design before we go and build it, uh, so that if we do build it, we don't break the internet um, in some unforeseen way uh, when that happens. So I'm going to start with three and a half problems uh, that we'd like to solve. Problem one is that although HTTPS and TLS and SSL um, produce lots of nice, tasty security, they're also kind of like Swiss cheese. There are holes in the security. Uh, and the holes are mostly around the authentication system, uh, or at least the big structural hard to fix holes are in the authentication system. Uh, and I gave a talk uh, with Jesse Burns last year here at CCC about some of those problems. Uh, that was a talk about the SSL observatory, where we uh, scanned port 443 of the uh, public web, all of it, IPv4, every address, port 443. We found there were hundreds of certificate authorities that were capable of uh, signing a certificate that would be good for any domain. So you could get a certificate for mail.google.com or addons.mozilla.org or ccc.de from any one of these hundreds of places, which means that an attacker would only need to break into the weakest one of these hundreds of places uh, in order to get a certificate. And it turns out that even if these hundreds of places do a really good job, they put their private keys inside hardware security modules that are super secure and they're very good implementers, they don't write bugs, um, they write perfect code, they defend themselves. There are other problems. Uh, what these certificate authorities do when they're getting it right, many of them, is called domain validation. Uh, and the process there is that Alice wants a, a certificate for mail.google.com, so she can be HTTPS mail.google.com. Uh, and so she goes to a certificate authority and says, hey, I'm, I'm mail.google.com. And they say, OK, let us check. And they email uh, root at mail.google.com, uh, or maybe the, the technical contact in the DNS entry. Um, and they see, is Alice able to click a link or find a secret from that email that they sent her? Um, and if she can, they'll issue a certificate for mail.google.com. Um, so this creates an attack surface that's bigger than just the CAs themselves. Uh, it's their routers, their ISPs routers, uh, DNS servers all over the place, the ones the, the ISPs use, the ones that uh, maybe exist on the other side the, uh, at the server end. Um, and so really, instead of looking at just this attack surface of hundreds of, of places you could go to break into TLS, you're talking about all these routers that are scattered around as well. And we'll see in a moment how this has gone wrong in practice. Um, but the attack surface is vast. It's not only these routers. We also saw from the survey that approximately 52 countries uh, have these certific certificate authorities. So you can make this attack happen in lots of different places, whether by technical or political means. So that was problem one. Problem two, what happens when the certificate is not right? you get this little warning message, different versions of it on particular platforms and browsers, but it all always looks something kind of like this. Um, and when you see this, 99, maybe 99.9% .9 of the time, it's an administrative error. Actually, it's the right certificate. No matter how scary the warning looks, the correct user response is probably to find the, uh, the way to uh, get around. Microsoft has been clever here. They've tried to make green no and red yes, but you learn actually red is what I want. I want to get through the warning to the site that I'm trying to go to. And 99.9% .9 of the time, that's the right thing to do. Uh, what this means is that certificate warnings are totally useless. Uh, humans are trained to get through them. Uh, even experts really struggle to understand what the right certificate looks like, uh, and then they learn to click through it. Problem three is 
widespread surveillance by governments of the internet and widespread censorship by governments of the internet. And these two subjects are intertwined. Um, but what we're realizing is that X509, which is the system of certificates that TLS uses to do authentication, um, was not engineered, was not designed to be able to cope with attacks by governments or any other kind of resourceful adversary. You know, get five people at random out of the audience tonight, they will be able to break this thing. Um, and this is going wrong in practice. It's not just a theoretical attack. Um, for instance, illustrating problems one and three, uh, the DigiNotar hack uh, by an apparently Iranian uh, hacker, uh, which was then turned into a weaponized deployment against Iranian Gmail users uh, that got 300,000 Gmail usernames and passwords. And we don't know what happened uh, to all the people whose accounts were compromised that way. Uh, how many of them, if any, suffered real-world consequences. But the odds are not great uh, if you've got a regime like Iran that's trying to surveil its citizens. And I take this kind of personally as well, because at some point I went on, uh, I did an interview at EFF, we sometimes, sometimes do press, and, and an Iranian journalist uh, for Voice of America called me up and said, you know, can we do an interview? Can, can you tell people in Iran about how to use the web safely, how to communicate safely? And I, you know, I said, look, there's probably nothing that you can do that's really safe, but if you want something that's simple enough that you're not going to get it immediately wrong if you're not technical, use Gmail and use it over HTTPS to talk to someone else who's also using Gmail over HTTPS. That's pretty hard for the Iranian government to break, and Google's kind of on your side. But when this kind of thing happens, I, I guess I take it personally. Um, you worry about the advice you give people. Uh, another example, this is illustrating problems two and three. So here we have the Syrian version of the same attack. The target this time is Facebook rather than Gmail. Um, unlike Iran, Syria wasn't sophisticated enough to break into one of the certificate authorities. So instead, what they did is they just made a fake certificate that was wrong, we didn't check out, wasn't valid in your browser. Um, but who the hell is able to read the details in these certificates? Maybe the people in this room? Maybe. But not the average person in Syria who's been trained, if they see this warning, to click through it. And so we can be sure that when this kind of attack happens, 30, 50, 60, 70, some percentage of people still turn over their usernames and passwords uh, to a man in the middle attack like this, uh, and they still have their lives in danger afterwards. Um, and then some cases purely of, um, actually this should be problem three, I guess, not problem one. Uh, censorship in general is becoming more pervasive on the internet. Uh, and the list of countries uh, is getting longer and longer and it includes bizarre examples. I'm actually Australian, not American. So uh, Australia for me is an alarming case where my, my home country that's usually pretty democratic and seemingly open is about to or at least getting close to, to passing a law that uh, would censor pornography just randomly uh, by connection blocking or DNS, we don't know exactly. But, and then you have your usual kind of suspects of authoritarian regimes that we like to blame for censorship. And, and then the United States, which has, in the last year, started seizing domain names that belong to law-abiding websites. Um, and so we have this mess. We have governments running around censoring things. Um, another interesting example was Kazakhstan uh, in June this year, which made a demand to Google saying, any Kazakh Google user, we have a right to have access to their data. We want to be able to see their Gmail, we want to be able to see their search terms, um, they're our citizens, we need to be able to see what they're doing. Uh, Google's response to this in Kazakhstan was to turn off Google.kz. Like, we're not going to be in Kazakhstan, goodbye. Um, the same response, I guess, that they ultimately took with China. But here's the situation. When Google decides to do that, if Google turns off Google.kz, um, the Kazakh government, which controls the .kz top-level domain, um, can control DNS responses and email for Google.kz, which means they can get a certificate for a Google.kz domain, which means that they can control HTTPS Google.kz with the lock icon, it's perfect, it's secure, it's all done, but it's the, the Kazakh government and not Google. Um, and Google, of course, um, can't do very much about this. They can't even stop using that domain name because users in Kazakhstan have learned that what they do is they type google.kz. And the fact that one day control of that domain passes from Google to the Kazakh government and ceases to be a, a web service 
uh, run by a US company and suddenly a, that maybe does some abstract commercial surveillance that doesn't matter very much to them to you know, serious political surveillance in their own country, um, this is a problem. Similar example, uh, maybe a different example, um, this is a vb.ly. For those of you from San Francisco, Violet Blue is kind of a local character. Uh, she bought vb.ly and set up on that domain the world's first and, is it first and only? First and only sex positive URL shortener. Uh, and she did this and got a splash of fame. And then more fame when she discovered that .ly is the Libyan top level domain name. And Libya didn't like the fact that their top level domain name was being used to host uh, a sex positive service. Um, th that turned out to not hurt anyone really. But um, who else uses .ly? Um, about, as far as I can tell, if I'm just Googling this, Bitly market share, the answer seems to be about 2 billion links a month uh, are processed through Bitly. Um, and most of our government just went to war against the Libyan regime. Uh, and quite fortunately, um, we were lucky. Um, the regime that we just went to war with didn't realize, didn't have the sophistication, wasn't able to use its control of the .ly domain name to launch a cyber, you know, like a malware, fingerprinted malware payload to two billion URLs in the space of a month. Maybe they'd only have gotten a day, but they could have owned a lot of machines in a very short period of time with that. And they could have done it over HTTPS. If we'd been checking for that, it wouldn't have helped. Um, some people will say, well, you shouldn't be using .ly. You know, before you set up a website, you should think about who you want to be uh, subject to in terms of the rules. Unfortunately, that ship has sailed. The amount of money that has been spent on setting up famous websites on huge scattered clouds of top-level domains is enormous. Um, you can't pull them all down. Secondly, control of domain names changes. You know, the regime in a country may change after you decided that, like, under the old top-level domain, you were happy doing business there. Now you're not anymore, vice versa. Um, companies and countries actually sell control of these things, and ICANN's about to hand out, you know, an unbounded number of new top-level domain names to anyone who show, shows up and pays some money. So basically, the situation we're facing is you can't, as a sensible policy mechanism, say, look, we're just going to partition up the internet into countries and zones, and our security policies will be totally determined by what zone you happen to pick. Um, well, if we do that, we're, gonna, we're exposing ourselves to enormous risks. Um, so there's another half a problem that I'm just going to state for people who know a bit about Tor. Tor has these really great things called hidden services. These are probably the best like high secure censorship resistant methods we have to connect to a server somewhere. Um, they use these URLs um, that look like this. This is a hash of a key in here. Uh, and the problem, they're great, but the problem is that there's no way to remember one of these URLs. Uh, if some service that you heard about six months ago suddenly becomes relevant to you now and you haven't kept this, this thing, how do you remember that? Uh, also, these things are kind of slow. Um, maybe they're great if you're under attack right now, but they're slow to use all the time. So what would a good solution to these three and a half problems look like? Um, first of all, we'd like something, a system, where the user types in a name or they click a link and they just automatically and transparently get a really secure and censorship resistant connection to that name that they were trying to talk to. Um, in a way that's safe against this huge collection of third parties that we currently know can be used to compromise a, a TLS connection. Uh, and it works out of the box um, for a name you haven't looked up before. So if you get a new machine and open it up, you're safe from day zero. Or if you walk into an internet cafe and you get lucky and the machine that you're sitting down at doesn't have malware on it, you then get a safe connection. Malware is maybe a separate harder problem. Enough hard problems for one talk. Um, and there's no crazy UI. 
No moment when the UI just asks you a weird question you don't know the answer to. Um, and this, this system uh, should fall back to a secure routing mechanism when you're under attack or your connection is being blocked. Uh, also kind of an addendum, a domain name system, currently consensus-based, global, valuable, and fragile. Whatever we do, let's try not to break it too much. Um, so those are the requirements, and here is a design that perhaps uh, gets close to meeting some of them. Uh, so the, the, the one level statement of the idea is, let's have a named key mapping. Let's put it in a semi-centralized, cryptographically append-only data structure. So you can write to this data structure, but you can't change what's in it already, and that's enforced by some crypto. But to explain how this works, let's just start by imagining that somehow, magically, you look into a crystal ball and you know a sovereign key for the name that you're trying to look up, this thing called a sovereign key. Uh, what do you use them for? Use one. You're connecting to addons.mozilla.org to install some code on your machine into your browser. Um, and uh, there's a certificate chain that's presented uh, currently uh, when you do TLS. And if we're doing, uh, if you see there are signatures here uh, from two different, well, the, these are the same key, but chaining up to two different root CAs. Um, that's how things currently work. Um, with the sovereign key, you add this extra magical little thing onto the end of the chain, which uh, a, an old legacy browser ignores. It just looks at this stuff and works out if the set is valid or not. But if it knows to check, it goes over here and says, ah, there's an extension here that says sovereign key magic. Um, and this sig signature has slightly different semantics uh, to the normal X509 signatures. I, most of you probably won't get this, but if, if you wrangle X509, you'll realize that here, uh, in the normal case, this signature is bound to this key, so you can't cross-sign uh, with a different key in ordinary X509. This is a kitchen sink file format that normally does everything. The one thing we need it to do, it doesn't do, which is two signatures onto the key you're actually using. So we use a hack uh, to put it in there with a special extension. Uh, and Adam Langley has been implementing this for Chrome for their pinning stuff, so this bit's done. Um, okay, so that was use one. We have a nice way of verifying that you're talking to the website you really thought you were talking to, even when all the CAs in the world could one day get hacked, assuming your crystal ball works. Um, use two. Suppose you know there's a sovereign key for example.ly. Um, but you connect to example.ly and you don't get the cross signature. It looks, the thing you, you see looks like this and not like that. Or you don't get any response at all. Then what you do, uh, you fall back to a censorship circumvention path, which could be either a proxy or a VPN, or if you're gonna actually go all out, you use Tor Hidden Services. And you can do this fairly safely because you know you have the sovereign key to verify that if you make this alternative connection, if you succeeded, you'll know you, you, you can tell. If you fail, you know you can tell. Um, so the, the, the strongest case of this, we're going to do a Tor Hidden Service. How do you get this weird magic string? You take the hash of the sovereign key that the crystal ball gave you. Um, and you only use this when you're under attack and your direct connection is being blocked. So it's not super slow. So, the thing you're probably wondering is, how does the crystal ball look? Okay, if you have a crystal ball, you can get somewhere on this problem. But how do you get one of these? Um, using this append-only data structure, which is, I want you to imagine it's like a pile of books. Um, if you've got a pile of books, um, you can put a new book on top, uh, and you can see what books are in the stack, but you can't change the, the books in the middle without causing the whole stack to fall over. Now, it would be bad if a stack of important stuff for our internet security infrastructure fell over, so we're not gonna just have one of these. We'll have a bunch of stacks, and if someone, like, bumbling giant walks into the room and knocks one over, or someone sneaky at a hacker conference knocks one over, you have some more, and as long as one of the stacks is still up, you're still okay. Uh, of course, if someone knocks over five of your six or 19 of your 20, you have to put some more stacks up really quickly, but it gives you some time. 
Um, and then the internet is large. There are a lot of devices connected to it. So in order to, in order to get the, the, the data in the stack out to lots of people, you make lots of copies of the stack. Um, but you have one master copy that these are all made from, uh, or one master set of 10 or 20 stacks that they're all made from. Um, and so what security does this get you? Compared to the situation today where an attacker just needs to break into one of these hundreds or thousands of systems, here they need to break into one of those systems and have a time machine to go back in time before you wrote into the append-only data structure and put your sovereign key there. Uh, and so if the attacker moves first, they can do this, but if you decided you wanted a secure domain name and you set that up, too late, they can't attack you. Not, not in the authentication layer anyway. Okay, so that's a, a metaphor level description. How does this work in detail? What's, what's the, what, the actual data structure? So we have 10 to 20 of these things. We're gonna call them timeline servers rather than stacks because they serve as a timeline for the keys. Um, they look a bit like this. Um, they're very simple. Uh, each entry has a serial number. The serial numbers go up by one. They have a timestamp. Uh, the timestamps need to be monotonically increasing. So each timestamp needs to be larger than the one before it. And then they have a signature from each of the timeline servers. So the timeline servers have public pri private key pairs. The clients will ship with the public keys of the timelines. Um, and, and you can see you have a signature here for each of these array entries. And then anyone who's using this protocol can check that the append-only property is correct. They do that by checking. Uh, when I see an entry, does it have different data to another entry I saw from this timeline server with the same serial number? If yes, now I have signed proof that this particular timeline server failed to be append-only, and so it's broken and I can publish that and the whole world will stop trusting it. Did the monotonicity of these timestamps get violated? Did you have a higher serial number with a lower timestamp? If yes, that's evidence, signed, that this timeline was bad, so everyone stops trusting it. Um, did one of these entries contain semantically self-inconsistent data? If yes, then again, that's evidence that the timeline was bad and everyone stops trusting it. And then you have a little peer-to-peer -peer protocol for the, the mirroring servers and the clients that rely on this stuff to spot these. Now, what's inside one of these particular entries? The most basic kind of entry is the creation of a new sovereign key. Um, so I'm making one, and there are two parts to this. There's a key info and some evidence. The key info uh, looks like this. If I'm protecting EFF.org with one of these things, I say, uh, okay, the domain is EFF.org. Here's my key. It should be like a 224 or 256-bit ECC key by default, but you could use something else. Um, I'm saying it's gonna support these protocols. Or you could say all protocols that ever have used sovereign keys, if you wanted to. Um, it'll expire, and here's an expiry date that can't be greater than when my domain name is gonna expire. So depending on who your top level domain is, you could make one of these things for 10 years or 20 years or 100 years if your TLD allows that. Um, wildcard equals true. This just means it's the default case that I can make x.y.z.eff.org. Uh, but if I make this false, then you can have a policy of special different sovereign keys for different subdomains. Um, and then this last little mysterious thing that we'll talk about later in case of revocation and then some other names. Now, what's the second field in here? The uh, evidence. How do I get to prove that I'm EFF.org? Well, we use the existing standard. So I need to show up with a, um, a CA signed certificate chain that would be valid in a browser. Um, signed by one of the standard CAs, and then I sign from that key in there over this whole claim. So to get into the thing, I just use the existing standard. Um, if DNSSEC ever works, we can use that instead of CAs. When DNSSEC works, we can use it instead of CAs. Um, and then what I do, I make this thing, I write it to one of the timeline servers as a kind of master write, and sort of any policy that's being applied um, to the writing in addition to this stuff happens there. And then I also replicate my write to all of them. And so long as one of the 10 or 20 that I wrote to at first is still alive, my sovereign key is still there. How do the mirrors work? 
A mirror is an IP address and a public key, or identified that way. It should have a two to three terabyte disk on it. Um, I, in the design, we said this cost $100. I guess that's now $200. Uh, hopefully, it'll go back down to $100 uh, when, when floods stop happening. Um, the expected amount of data, if, if a sovereign key was made for every domain in existence right now, you'd have about 100 gigabytes of data. But you want a lot of headroom so that this thing can just keep growing. Uh, or you can get DOS attacks and survive them. Um, and then if it gets really large, right now you could just boot, bootstrap using the protocol, but if it gets really large, the ultimate way to bootstrap one of these mirrors is by disk over snail mail. You go to Amazon, you say, send me a disk, uh, a three terabyte disk preloaded with the one terabyte of sovereign key data on it, and now you have a mirror. And then the updates get synced. Uh, you can go to one of the, you can go to the set of, of masters and read from them, or you can do peer-to-peer, -peer, ask in the mirror, what does it have? Um, but each mirror has a copy of everything on all of the timelines. And the updates are of the form, give me all the entries since number n, or number x, um, and then it, you also get a t this thing called a timeline freshness message, um, which is a bit like one of the entries in the timeline, except it's sm it has no data in it, which makes it really small, uh, and then it's produced pretty regularly, like maybe once a minute or more often. <clears throat> How do the clients query the, mir query the mirrors? They say, I want to go to google.com. What do you have for that name? Or what do you have for that name since entry number, and then you pick a number. Um, the mirrors reply, well, I have these entries since y. Um, y can be less than x uh, for DOS prevention reasons, which you can figure out if you're worried about that. Um, you put the freshness messages in there. So you're saying, I have looked at all the timelines as of and a list of when you looked at them all. And this is used to keep the mirrors honest. Mirrors could omit things, um, but the fact that they sent you an, a response here that omitted something and then claimed that their data was fresher than that and then they, they signed it means that you can catch them when they do this. Um, so that's the basic protocol. Uh, and that's moderately complicated. Now it'll get a little bit more complicated when we add a whole bunch of real world things that you want, like revocation. Self-signed only, um, which means you need to not lose your keys. It's fine if your keys get hacked, there's a recovery for that, but you need to make five copies of your key, put them in vaults somewhere, um, or get someone else to do that for you and pay them for it. Um, the way the revocation works, um, I put a new entry on the timeline sometime later with a self-signed revocation. And then how do I recover? We go back to the original entry. When I made the key for EFF.org, I picked who in the world I would trust if I ever had been hacked and needed to recover. And so you can choose out of the whole wide world which organization or company or whatever to bail you out if you're in trouble, or a few of them. So EF, at EFF, we might pick the ACLU, uh, CCC, and Bits of Freedom. Uh, and if we ever got so badly hacked that someone broke into our vault and stole our sovereign key, uh, we'd issue a self-signed revocation and then come up over here to Berlin and say, can we have the, the CCC make us a new key? And so then the CCC would uh, put this thing on the timeline saying we're reissuing EFF.org. Here's the new key for EFF.org, signed, and then they put their signature here. Um, you can renew the things. I said at the beginning, you get it for a certain period of time. They expire just to prevent pollution of the namespace, but you can renew yourself. So if you're still around, still using the domain, and you can write to one of the timelines, you can renew. Uh, if you want to transfer to someone else, you just do this thing, but instead of going to the CCC and saying, help, we've been hacked, um, please make us a new key, I come along and I bring the new person who's buying EFF.org and say, hi, CCC, I, I'm transferring my domain, can you please do the same operation, and this time we'll, we'll make a new key for someone else. Um, so, that's the design. We put it up uh, a, little, a, a little while ago, started showing it to people. Uh, there are a few attacks and problems that people pointed out with the design. Um, thus far, they've all been fixable. Um, they make things a little bit more complicated each time, but the design doesn't seem to have fallen over yet. Attack one, um, denial of service. We're going to get a portion of 
DNSSEC, if that's in place, some subdomain somewhere, we're going to make a.domain.com, b.domain.com, ab.domain.com, bb.domain.com. We're going to make a sovereign key for each one of these things. We're going to fill up all of those two and three terabyte hard drives. And it's a very expensive attack to be defending against because you have to keep the attacker's records forever. Um, or you do this with a CA that will issue free certificates. If you go and write them, pay them a big check, they, they write you an unlimited number of certificates, you make keys with them. Um, there's a hybrid fix that I think works for this, which is we make a list of the portions of, of DNS space that you can't get for free. So just portions of the, the namespace that we know you have to pay money to get a, a name in. Um, and for everything outside of that, we demand a CA cert from a non-free CA. Um, and then all of this kind of works, but an attacker may get around it. They'll discover a place in the domain name system where there are free domains that we didn't know about. So in order to survive for the day where they discover that, you use rate limiting. And rate limiting to the real rate of creation of domain names gives you like a year of safety via rate limiting. So you have like a few days to figure out who was attacking you, what part of the namespace, or what CA they were using to attack you, and then to remove the things they were using from your enumerated list. So the defense seems to work. Um, next big problem, next attack, is that transition could be messy. If we wanted to put this thing in a dot .key top-level domain, it'd all work. Except we want to use this system for existing domain names. We want google.com to get this protection. We want uh, eff.org to get this protection. We want uh, wikileaks.org to get this protection. Um, which means that, conversely, bad guys can break into TLS servers and then try to make a sovereign key for the victim domain. And they're totally legit. They own the TLS server. They can make it do anything they want. Uh, and so it's going to check out. This is a slightly messy mitigation, but maybe it'll work. Um, we have a two-week pending period for a new registration of the sovereign key. While you're waiting, you get a bunch of warning emails that go out to the technical contacts, the DNS contact, root at the domain.com, saying, hey, are you really doing this? If not, click this link, and we'll stop it. Um, and then you say, the domain also, when we hit it from a 1,000 different directions, has to always redirect HTTP to HTTPS, and it has to set the HSTS header. And what this is doing, oh, and it has to have this URL here, uh, that it responds to with a request for the sovereign key saying, yes, I promise I, I want a sovereign key. Um, what this is doing um, is it's filtering the set of domains that can make one of these to domains that have very competent and obvious HTTPS deployments, um, which reduces you from 2 by 10 to the 8 domain names down to less than 1,000 domain names right now. Um, and for most domains, the, the website admin is going to notice if uh, three and four are true. Just their site is going to wake up, they're going to wake up and their site's going to behave differently and look differently. Um, so this is a, uh, a protection that should reduce the number of domains that get hacked and then get down to six, which is where you go, man, we really screwed up. Someone actually made a sovereign key for google.com against their wishes. Okay, we'll put a line in the source code that says, dig ourselves out. This is not, hopefully not an attack vector for censoring people, because if it's in your source code, you, you can also remove it uh, if you're the client and you don't like the line in the source code. So the theory is very few attackers get to six. Um, but you know, I want to see if people are persuaded by this. Uh, number three, this is not atta an attack so much as just a problem. Um, and it's a problem that Adam Langley pointed out. Um, and it's a problem with hotel networks and airport networks and other captive portals. So you, you all know these places, they're really annoying. Um, you meet these things and they block everything uh, that you want to do, all the side channels you want to use to ask about sovereign keys. So you can't make a query for any domain to see if there's a sovereign key for it or what it is. And then the captive portal wants you to do HTTPS to give them your credit card number. And so you can't treat that safely, right? You, in order to, to be safe with every domain out there on the web, you need to demand information about sovereign keys before you talk to it. But the captive portal wants you to do HTTPS with no side channels. 
Um, so how are you going to lo load the auth page safely? <clears throat> Another hackish workaround, we get a browser, Firefox or Chrome, or maybe just a popular extension, we instrument it to detect captive portals. They're pretty easy to detect. They have the property that when you try to go to lots of different domains, they all redirect you to one domain. So you get the set of one domains that are the result of those redirections. And you whitelist them all out of the sovereign keys um, system in the source code. Just these, these domains can't have a sovereign key. You don't need to look it up. They don't have one. And then this is not a security problem because if any of these domains ever does make a sovereign key, you go back to the source code and you delete them from the, the whitelist. So no one who wants the security benefit of a sovereign key ever accidentally gets put on the whitelist, but all the hotel networks get put on there automatically. And then maybe people are worried, well, what about new or non-public captive portal networks? We let these people figure it out themselves. Like day one, we ship this thing, we whitelist all the existing captive portals, and then we say, in future, here's a spec for how to write a captive portal correctly. Here's how to let sovereign keys queries through. Um, and we make them deal with that. So this is ambitious, um, and it's a, currently a vaporware design that I'm just here to ask you guys about. Um, but I think it's at least possibly achievable. We at least have a chance of building this if we want to, if we think it's a good idea uh, to make the web a lot more secure and a lot more censorship resistant than it currently is. Um, but you also get a sense of some of the kind of extra operational complexity we're going to get into if we decide to go down this road. If we want to make domains and websites more secure, they're more secure, but you have more homework to do. You have to back up your keys and put them in vaults. Um, so uh, we have a mailing list. We have a, des a detailed design document. If you want to go through it with a fine tooth comb, attack it. Uh, we'll have code appearing when it's good enough for people to look at. Um, and uh, also, of course, I have to do this ma mandatory. We're a nonprofit organization. We do this stuff for the community because we think it's, it's important to do it. Uh, if you like what we do, uh, now is a great time to donate to us because uh, Sergey Brin and his partner are giving double matching donations for the next month or two. Um, so I think that's my spiel, and I'd love some questions. So I'm sure there will be a lot of questions. I can see it from now. So I'll just start here in the front with the first question. Thank you. Um, do I have sound? OK. Um, I have a problem with the privacy issues, because all the clients have to look up at your service mm -hmm. for every website you mm -hmm. visit. So the clients have to pick one of the mirrors. There's no policy saying which mirror they have to pick. Um, so if we go back to a diagram that has mirrors in it, um, there are lots of these machines around, and they have to query one of them. So if you want to, there are a lot of different ways you can approach the privacy issue. You can have a client that tends to prefer, prefer a mirror run by their own ISP. Um, and that's kind of the equivalent of the existing DNS model. Um, or you could choose to have you know, a client that picks a, um, a mirror that's run by someone they trust and they get to specify some people that they think are trustworthy from a privacy perspective. Or they can take a latency hit and use a VPN or a proxy or Tor, um, which in this, uh, in this specification or proposal is built into the browser, so it's always available. You can take the latency hit and use Tor to do your, your lookups. Um, so there are a bunch of ways of answering the privacy question, um, and I think it's no worse than our current situation, and it's potentially better. Uh, another bigger issue I see is the revocation. Mm -hmm. uh, I work for TLD, and we already have a lot of problems with revocation. And adding another player into this field will make you uh, vulnerable to ransom issues. So it's certainly the case that revocation in this protocol is complicated. It's more complicated than it is currently. Um, not for just having a web server compromised, of course, because if it's just your operational key that gets compromised, that's fine. You just go to your sovereign key and you make a new operational key. You use the existing revocation mechanisms for the old key. But uh, if someone breaks into your backup systems, which they can do, and they get your sovereign key, um, we need to do one of two things when people make a sovereign key. The common case should be 
use a service provider that you trust for a sovereign key. Just one, you pick one. It could be CCC, it could be VeriSign, it could be um, uh, whoever. Pick one service provider who you trust and choose to trust instead of a thousand third parties. And they make the sovereign key for you, they look after it, they deal with backups. And if you're a corporation, they write a contract with a very large dollar value. If they lose your key, they're gonna pay you a million dollars. Um, the other model, if you're a hacker or a sysadmin, you wanna do this yourself, our command line tools for making a sovereign key need to make sure you made three to five backups before the key is registered. So the UI you have to build here is something like this. Backup one, give me a USB key or an SCP account I can copy to, or a Gmail address I can send it to, or a printer. I'm not sure about printers being safe anymore. I keep seeing these talks about printers, and I, I, I don't know that I want to print my key to make a paper copy, because I'm not sure the printer's going to delete the copy I sent it. Um, uh, and the UI says, okay, that was backup one, now backup two. Give me another USB key, another email address I can send it to, backup three, backup four. Okay, now maybe you can publish your sovereign key. Um, and so for people who want to run these things themselves, I think the default code needs to simply walk you through that, make it as hassle-free as possible, and then you are warned, right? If you, if you made four backups and you lost them all, okay, we made domains a little bit like physical property. It was like there was an actual object, a key that was your domain, you lost it. Um, now, people, like, that's a question I'm asking the room about. It's a cost. If we want to be censorship resistant, to a strong degree, this is an inconvenience we're gonna to have to, to pay, and I'm willing to hear people saying that price is too high. That's, that's one type of revocation, but the other part is that you actually change owners of the domain name, and the TLD lets the new owner just run it, but it forgets to tell you that you have sovereign keys as well that you have to buy from, from mm -hmm. somewhere else. So probably in cases of transfers, what you should do is, as a DNS operator, you should basically follow the advice of the sovereign key um, system. So if you see a sovereign key revocation and reissuance, you should go with that. You should never kind of let someone else other than the current sovereign key holder control the DNS. But you can still charge fees for DNS, of course. Like the DNS can go away, but if it's on, it has to go to the person who has the sovereign key. So you kind of move control over in that direction. And of course, DNS operators should do sovereign keys. Like they should be some of the people who offer these services to you. Okay, I if see. If you trust them. Oh, sorry. Okay, I see there is a question in the back. I would say that's making, rather than making Back copies of the sovereign, lots of back copies of the sovereign key. Actually, signing revocation and making copies of that. So, there's a low risk if those keys leak. The signed revocations actually leak. So, so you pre-sign revocations, put them with somebody you trust, and the worst they could do is revoke your key. That's right. Uh, that trust will be somebody else than the person who's trusted to re-sign the key. So the, the idea, there's a trade-off to making lots of backups, and by making more backups, you increase the risk that an attacker will get the key, but you reduce the risk that you'll lose all of your copies. Um, and that's the trade-off you want to make with this kind of design, because uh, you know that if, you, if the attacker revokes or you revoke, the fact that you picked at the beginning who was going to inherit the name for you uh, gave you kind of the better of the situation if you revoke. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Okay, we have uh, a few questions from the internet. Um, does the EFF see themselves issuing as keys for current TLDs? Um, what, what was the last, uh, what adjective did you have for TLDs? Sorry? You said something TLDs. Um, I repeat the question. Does the EFF see themselves uh, issuing Right? Mm -hmm. uh, as keys mm -hmm. for current TLDs. Grand TLDs. Current, sorry. Current. Oh, current TLDs. If you have, well, I don't think we will be doing the issuing, right? If, if we do anything here, we'd write the spec, write some code, um, help it 
you know, an experimental deployment where some people run some timeline servers, so they'd be the ones sort of making the sovereign keys. Uh, and then if, if people, if the, the thing ever gets deployed for real, it, it starts to be the browsers who are probably running some of the timelines and, and existing internet governance organizations that would run some of them. Um, the people who are really making the TLDs are those timeline servers who are um, receiving an X509 certificate chain and saying, yes, this is authority uh, of control over this domain name, and yes, here's a signature from that authority saying, I want a sovereign key. So I don't think EFF will be making the keys, but kind of helping set this, this kind of mechanism up. OK, another question. Uh, could or will SOPA make this illegal? Uh, that's an interesting question. Would SOPA make this illegal? Um, I think the answer is no, but it would be, we don't want SOPA to pass, and we, want, we don't want to have to have that fight. Um, and there are a couple of people, I don't know if we can get Corey and Rachel's questions in. Yeah, there are a lot of questions in the room, so let's take another question from front here. Uh, quickly then, um, the first one is, if, the, if your remedy to keys being leaked by a, a, um, someone who holds on to keys or keys being lost by someone who holds on to keys is these million dollar penalties written into contracts. Isn't that fundamentally a guarantee that they'll never tell you when they lose or leak keys because as soon as they've lost 100 keys, mm -hmm. that's a $100 million liability and there's no reason for them not to lie because lie or not, they'll just go out of business. And the second part of this is if part of the answer is you should figure out who you should trust, haven't we just reinvented trustee and every other failed system to ensure privacy and good practices on the internet? Um, fortunately not. Well, certainly compared to the one that we're currently living in with for TLS, where the model is not you choose who to trust, you actually are forced to trust mm -hmm. hundreds of organizations and loads of other machines around them that, that you have no control over. Um, it's also kind of a very different sort of trust. You know, trustee is in the business of running around to thousands of sites and saying their privacy practices are good, it's okay to do business with, casually with them. This is a different kind of model of, it's not a casual, I'm going to this site and getting some information there or, or renting a hotel room for the night and hoping they're not gonna track me. It's, I'm choosing to entrust my domain name uh, to these people and to the extent that I value my domain name, which is sometimes not very much, and it's sometimes enormously, uh, you know, I should evaluate the business, the one business, not hundreds, that I'm, doing, that I'm gonna uh, do this with and pick them. Um, and of course, you're not required to do this. Uh, you can do it yourself. It's just that, especially for corporations that run loads of websites, there needs to be a good default case answer for them. And so des us designing something that's you know, great for WikiLeaks or CCC or other hacker organizations, but not good for the rest of the web is sort of unrealistic. We need to have paths and options for the different operational philosophies you have. Um, the other part of your question was, how do you tell if, they're, um, if they've leaked the key? Um, or if they have lost it, I think you can tell in most cases. But I'll think about, there might be cases where your argument is, is uh, interesting. We'll take another question from the back. Okay, it's actually two questions. Um, the first is a problem where your sysadmin of a large corporation handles the so sovereign keys and he just walks away. Um, get sacked or whatever, he's the only one who had a sovereign key and he says, well, this is now not my problem anymore and you're left with a um, sovereign key not under your control and how do you recover in this case and who decides um, if you're the right owner if you actually get a key reissued? And the other question was, um, can I make domains worthless? by registering a uh, foreign key, uh, sorry, sovereign key, which is expiring maybe in 200 years, and then not just, just choosing not to pay for my domain name anymore, will the next owner actually be able to do anything with it? So answering the second question first, you can only make a sovereign key that's initially valid for as long as you've registered the domain name for. So only, you can only make a sovereign key that lasts 100 years if you go to a DNS registrar and pay them for registering a domain for 100 years, which you can do for some TLDs. Um, you can do that today. Um, so you can't 
make the sovereign key last longer than your initial registration of the domain. Um, uh, the first question about what do you do about a sysadmin who runs off with your keys, um, I think organizations already have this problem with their sysadmins potentially. You know, an, a sysadmin who deletes your backups and then rm-rfs all of your, your data servers can cause catastrophic damage to an organization. And so m managing that risk is a thing that every organization needs to do. They, you know, if they're large enough, they need to have like multiple copies of the crucial data that are outside of the control of one human. Um, and this does happen occasionally, but mostly you can rely on human dispute resolution mechanisms to try and do something about it. You know, you sue the sysadmin and say, you know, give us the key back, um, or else the sysadmin is liable. There's another question from here in the middle. No. Um, I have two questions actually. The first one is, is this scheme only valid for um, SSL server certificates or for clients and IPsec as well? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think you could use it for IPsec, but I'm not an IPsec expert, so um, I think certainly DTLS or any, like any other kind of um, similar model of what a connection looks like. Um, to TLS, you could use the same certificate for. For clients, um, I guess the way we handle namespaces here is not really optimized for the client certificate case, where you want to issue loads of usernames at some domain. Uh, so the way you would probably do that is by bolting on an extra mechanism. You'd say, well, cross-sign an operational key with your sovereign key and then sign the user's email keys with that operational key and you could build that glue but it's not part of the stuff we've been talking about thus far. And the second question is if somebody would have come up with this like 10 years ago, some very smart guy, and you would have a timeline with all of MD5 and RSA 512 bit uh, um, signatures inside, um, would this, uh, the protocol be, um, be vulnerable to um, algorithms going bad after 10, 15 years? Um, so what you want to do, you want to have probably one or two of these stacks that uses a different uh, algorithm, uh, maybe something that's a bit more expensive and a bit more secure, um, so that if you get a class break against what we thought was pretty good crypto, um, you're, you at least have one timeline still standing that lets you throw away the others, and then start rebuilding new, new timelines. Um, if you break all of them at once, uh, you have a crazy day where you have to dig yourself out. Um, uh, and then for the individual sovereign keys, if you chose to make a sovereign key using, some, uh, using an algorithm that's no longer secure, you know at some point you need to revoke it, reissue it, and use a stronger key. But, um, if we would have started with this like 10, 15 years ago, which algorithms did we have at which were common at that time which would stand uh, uh, st um, valid today? But I guess what I'm saying is you can rotate continuously in this design. So, okay. so, so you can put in a new, a new timeline. Anytime the clients want to ship an update, they can add a new timeline that uses a stronger algorithm. And then so long as you hadn't had all the existing ones destroyed beforehand, you can import uh, the entries from one timeline into the next one. Okay, we we'll take another question from the back. Um, I would like to know, I personally also use X509 certificates for email. So there's not a binding between a domain name and a public key. Instead, there's a binding between an email address and a public key. Uh, could I use sovereign keys also to um, improve the security of my email certificates? Because then the enrollment or adding the key to your database would be a little bit more difficult because I don't have an HTTPS server running on my email address. I think the answer is the same kind of yes as it was for um uh, for client certificates. So in principle, there's no reason why you couldn't chain from the sovereign key for the domain to an operational email key or you know, email issuing key for the domain and then down to individual users' email keys. Uh, but you'd need to write some code that we haven't talked about how to write to do the glue. Yeah, there was a follow-up. Do you want to ask the follow-up? Sorry. Uh, in this case, I would also like to protect my Gmail address so there's no cryptography binding between me and Google 
So I would have to do that independently of the organization belonging to that email address, uh, email domain name. So a, a, a server that had a policy of, of helping you do that, which I think you would need in this kind of hierarchical model of how domains function, they'd need to accept that, you know, okay, you send them your public key, they sign it for you, and now you have a public key for your email address. So if Gmail is willing to cooperate, you could do that. Okay, we have another question here in front. I think uh, you are offering a lot of technical details for a solution which is in, in depth analysis uh, a problem of trust. So what if China or another malicious country insists of running such a server and uh, insists of running all companies in this uh, country um, of, of preserving with, with their own uh, certificates? So you, you, you simply transferred to the problem of trust into a higher level which cannot be solved. It, it would be the same if you set up a wide list of, of uh, certificate authorities where you say, I can trust them, and if, you see, if I see anything others, I refuse anything. So this is just a lot of technical stuff around a simple problem of trust, which is not really solved by, by this approach, I think. I think the thing that I would say about this is, I don't care how malicious China is, I'm still probably willing to let them run some of these timeline servers. Because the important functions that the timeline servers perform are remotely cryptographically verified. And if the Chinese timeline server is malicious and tries to change history, the protocol detects it instantly. And you know, you need to test that. And so not, not, not changing history, but insisting of all services in this country have to trust my way of giving you a certificate. So it's not about changing history, it's about a law that says only we give you trust and anything else is forbidden. This is the same with the DNS. The DNS has a problem that every crappy country can, uh, can, give, is, is, is an anchor, can, can act as an anchor of trust even if it's not trusted. But now we have another anchor of trust but the, the, the um, government can insist of we want to be the only anchor of trust for our companies and then you have the same problem on a, on a higher level. So which part do you think, that, which part, which of the functions in here are you saying the Chinese government would take control of or insist upon? They insist that they provide you with this certificates. They, the, the, they want to be the the authority which creates all these certificates on the server. So China is simply uh, saying mean, we want to create the certificates. Do you mean these uh, CA signed certificate chains that uses yes. evidence? Uh, and it's only located in this country, and not in. Uh, and they uh, they by law forbid any uh, company running a service in this country to accept anything from outside this country. Sir, if. Let me try and make a version of this. China insists that everyone uh, who makes a sovereign key in China uses CNNIC, and then un contrary to usual existing practices for CNNIC, where you send them a certificate request and they make a certificate, they actually demand your private key before they let you make a CNNIC certificate. Um, the only way they can enforce this is by the threat of physical force against Chinese companies. Um, and there's no amount of cryptography that will help you if you're an identifiable Chinese company and the Chinese government is willing to walk in and use the power of their state against your physical presence if you're an identified actor inside their country. So um, nothing we can do technically will ever give a Chinese corporation or any other like overt human organization with flesh and blood in China the power to speak uh, with complete um, impunity in a regime that doesn't legally allow that. Uh, but if you're not a company in China, if you're a blogger in China and you want to do this, the Chinese government can't tell it to you. You can post your Chinese blog and they have no way to know that it, it was me that was writing that blog. Uh, this system gives you all the pieces you need to blog in China anonymously and, and uh, you know, have a chance of staying that way. It's not guaranteed, of course. Okay, there's another question from my colleague in the back. Hi, um, I wanted to go back to the first question and the comparative risk sort of privacy and surveillance to DNS. Uh, if one's worried about governments doing strategic surveillance uh, on, a, on a very large scale, 
I mean, wouldn't you need as many mirrors as currently there are DNS servers? I mean, aren't one, isn't one concentrating down the flows of interesting traffic about which websites people are checking out down to a very much smaller number of servers, and those are correspondingly much easier to surveil? You probably want, I mean, I anticipate you would have lots of these. I mean, I expect for a small, like, experimental deployment, you'd have dozens, and then if, you, if this became big, you'd have thousands, or as many as DNS servers, ultimately, sure. Um, but if people want the privacy protective option, um, using Tor to query a hostile mirror is not a bad way to go, because sure, the mirror sees that someone looked up a particular domain, but it came from a Tor exit node, and they can't, uh, you know, they can't tell that it was you. So if, if you want the privacy of, of your DNS queries and you're willing to take the latency hit, there's a, a way to get that. OK, there are some more questions from the internet. OK, um, how does one guarantee that the first key for the server in the timeline server is not spoofed? Uh, the first key for the sovereign timeline server is not spoofed. So, um, when a when the client implementers choose to let someone uh, set up a timeline server, you know they they go to that organization and they they make a human effort. Okay, he means uh, like in a every country. Um, well, you only have ten or twenty of these things. Oh, so how do you? Well, there, there are two versions. How does the how do the public keys of the timeline uh, servers get into the client source code correctly? And that's a problem that like we and hypothetically browser vendors would have to deal with in talking to the timelines. But if we got it wrong, it wouldn't be too bad because having an evil timeline only lets them violate the timeline append only property, and we detect it and it goes away. So it's not too bad if it's the wrong key. Um, uh, so you have some protection there. Then how do you get the right version of the client software? Well, that's an existing problem we struggle with, but, you know, the chicken and an egg. You want the first operating system that ships on your machine to be good, and if it's bad, okay, you can be in trouble. You want the first copy of the OS CD that you put into your CD-ROM drive to be good, and if it's bad, okay, maybe you have a problem. We, we can't solve the malware problem. Um, okay. Um, how do you convince users in every countries that you, sorry, that try to kill so, uh, S keys to not go around it if it's fail? Um, so I think the, qu the version of the question is if a country tries to like block the entire protocol from getting deployed. Um, I, th I think that was the question, and that's a, a reasonable question to ask. So I'm yeah. Iran, and I just try and block every single sovereign key protocol request coming into and out of my country. And we know from the Tor talk, some days they can do that, some days they struggle to, it's kind of an arms race. Um, if you turn this on in browsers by default, on the day that they, um, they block access to the protocol, you basically start in the spec, a, a clock ticking because clients will be willing to sort of operate with their existing cache of keys for a little while. Um, but if it gets to a certain amount of time and they can't find any mirrors that look good, they go, wait a minute, I'm under attack. I'm shutting down. I won't query any domain at all. And so on that day, Iran blocked sovereign keys and all of the internet stops functioning in Iran. So it fails safe. Uh, which gives them the choice. Sure, they can turn off the internet in their country, but if they want the internet to work with modern browsers, then either they let the sovereign key, key queries through or they block everything. So uh, I'm really, really sorry, but we're already over time, and I see there are a lot of questions in the room. And I'm sure there, after the talk, there is a lot of time to ask questions, uh, but I have to cut here the official part of the talk. And uh, I thank you again for the interesting talk, for the talk that raised many questions. And I ask again for a warm round of applause for our speaker. Thank you very much.